So in that, we are really working to teach job seekers how to navigate a digital hiring process. Uh, for any of you who entered the market for the first time in at five years, really, then you probably realized that the market is absolutely nothing like what it was five years ago. Um, the way we find jobs. Uh, I go back to when I was a senior in high school and I was going to find a job. My mom dropped me off um, on one part of Hewland Street and said, you just walk down all these little stores and you go in and fill out an application and somebody will give you a job. And that's exactly what happened. I got hired as a hostess at Red Lobster. And that's just how we found jobs in 1998. That is not how we find jobs in 2020, not even on a digital sense. So what we do is we help people by writing resumes, by um, teaching job search strategy, optimizing LinkedIn, helping people network and learn how to network strategically. I am not somebody who spam networks. That is not my approach. So if that's what you're hoping for, I'm sorry, I can't help you. And then I do teach interview coaching as well as we provide tools and resources. And something that you'll find I do a lot is go out and research free tools and resources and then distribute those out to the network. I am not sponsored or paid by anyone. So if I ever teach you something or recommend something and you don't use it, I am not personally offended. I have absolutely no skin in that game. So just a little about me. Um, LinkedIn is different than other social media platforms. So I know you guys all came to hear more about LinkedIn and why you care about it as a job seeker. So I'm hoping to answer those questions for you. People you know talking about things you care about, this phrase is on the walls in the engineering room at LinkedIn. This is the whole premise behind the algorithm. So all of these strategies of spam people, connect with people you don't know, which I am all about expanding your network, just do it in a way you can keep up with it, right? So when I was a teen leadership teacher or educator, I worked at the high school and what I learned in our program, because we went from four students to 250 in less than a year, because it, they continued to recruit, but I had to learn this. If you grow faster than your core it can handle, it will change your values, it'll change your culture. And when you grow your network bigger than what you can maintain relationships with, it will become spammy. It will become disjointed and disconnected. And when you post, it's the reason like I have 11,700 people on my LinkedIn. But when I post, there's like 2,000 that see them, right? It's not everybody sees that everybody's engaging. That's not how it works. So it's not always bigger, better. I accept a lot of connection requests. I recommend you be much more strategic, mostly because I get spammed all day. Um, but I do recommend growing your network and having meano, meaningful conversations with people that you don't know. Um, so it's just the way you do that. So don't connect with more than about three people. And when you connect with them, reach out to them and say, hey, thanks for connecting. How can I support your network? Okay. All right. So people you know, talking about things you care about foundational thoughts behind the algorithm. So the algorithm, I'll explain that a little bit more, but people like Richard Bransom, who has 17 million followers and Bill Gates with 28 million followers, they don't really need a boost to engage their readers, right? That will happen organically. People naturally follow them. Richard Bransom has a reputation or a brand about inspiring people, creating great leadership content, um, having food for thought that will inspire you people naturally will flock to that. So I always teach that if you're not entertaining, educating, or inspiring somebody, then your LinkedIn post may be of the wrong mindset, okay? Um, the average person has 930 connections and could use a little help making, um, getting that engagement, right? And so the people in their network, we need them to see their post and it's all based on these algorithms. It is not a rich getting richer approach like other platforms. So it's creator focused where uh, Facebook and Twitter and Instagram are all viewer driven. On Facebook, if you have a viral post, your next posts are actually boost higher. That's not the case in LinkedIn. Every post stands for itself. And it's all centered around the content creator trying to get them engaged in creating more content. So you have these people with large networks, their posts are boost because of the engagement, not because the algorithm boosted it. Does that make sense? Okay. 
The premise was built on driving traffic to content creators who would appreciate the feedback from their connections. The theory here is Richard Bransom doesn't care if one more person likes his post because 5 million people saw his post. So he's not really worried about whether or not one more person likes it. That doesn't make him create more content. And he has people creating content for him. But content creators are more likely to stay engaged and keep creating more content if people engage with their post, right? So LinkedIn engineers were like, you know, if Lori makes a post and she gets 10 likes, she's more likely to come back next week and post again. So let's boost her post and really let Richard Branson's post do what it does, okay? Let's see what's in the comments here. I'm going to try to watch this throughout the day too. I'm sorry. entertain oh linkedin posts need to entertain educate or what was my other one entertain uh, uh, i'll i'll go back to it i'm recording entertain educate inform and um, there's actually four and i'll go back on those and right now my brain is not shifting so i will go back um it's been that well, day and we're going to send out the presentation yeah later. i'll send the slide deck too absolutely um, and a lot of this comes from my ebook, and um, I can always send that to you guys too. So, hang on, my computer just had a mild seizure. It's that day, guys. All right. So, content creators are more likely to stay engaged if they keep and keep creating content if people engage with them and provide feedback to determine who uh, that appreciative crowd is. LinkedIn built a system that is that ranks content by either spam, low quality, or high quality content. Um, it is based on those automated rules. That's the algorithm, right? So the algorithm is just a fancy mathematical word to say a set of rules that the computer uses through machine learning to decide what to do with information when it receives it. So as soon as you post your by the um, great mathematical computer gods. It is ranked either spam, low quality, or high quality, okay? While the system is a bit complicated, I want you to understand it and how to harness that and you to use it to your advantage as a job seeker because the result should be that you get a job not to make you some influencer on LinkedIn. That's not really what we teach, but how to rank higher in recruiter searches so that they reach out to you, that's what we're trying to accomplish, okay? We know LinkedIn is a super powerful tool, right? LinkedIn is widely considered to be the go-to platform for business professionals. In 2020, it is considered the most powerful social media tool for business professionals, hands down, also for sales teams and recruiters. It's used by more than 675 million users. And last I heard that was up to 800 million after COVID. More than 20 million companies. And there are more than... Um, 14 million jobs posted on there each year, and they do a pretty good job of vetting because I can't go and create a job and make it look like it's for Toyota. I can only control what um, my page is associated with, so it kind of gets rid of some of that spam that you see on the other sites. 90% um, of recruiters report that they utilize LinkedIn as a sourcing tool. I'm going to tell you that depends on industry. And um, sometimes I really hesitate on stats like that because we, I'm sure where that state came from was a LinkedIn hole. Therefore, who would respond? It would obviously be. But like warehouse recruiters are not known to jump in and use LinkedIn to find warehouse uh, employees. So just kind of keep that in mind that that number may be slanted, but I will tell you, even as an aviation mechanic, um, once I started working with engineers, I... I started using LinkedIn and um, the, the companies I've been around, especially in technology and HR, um, anything administrative, they do use LinkedIn and it is a very widely accepted um, job sourcing tool. LinkedIn is 277% more effective for lead generation than Facebook and Twitter. Again, um, there's on the ebook, it'll tell you where that came from. And then 70 to 86% of companies use LinkedIn to find and screen candidates. Um, more than 1 million posts are made every single week. And you get the gist, right? It's a really powerful tool. But we know somebody was what, 148? Yeah, so if you know Penny Sprague, she was like the, 
she was like in the first 200 users of LinkedIn, true story. And you can find that. Um, I'll teach you that later, but you can actually go out and see what number you were. I was not an early adopter. Um, but that was not my world. If you notice, you don't see a lot of teachers on there. I didn't get into LinkedIn until I became a corporate employee. The more I learn about LinkedIn the, and the way algorithms work, the more I realize I have a lot to learn, right? The more I know, the more I realize I don't know. Every expert has a different opinion. I get it. And I think the, that's mostly because every person seems to look at it from their own specific angle. I tend to look at the overall data. So I look at it from how a job seeker should use it. Other people who are into branding and trying to help you become an influencer may look at it from a different piece. They may recommend a different profile setup. They may do, recommend a different way to use it. But we specifically look at LinkedIn from the aspect of how can we help job seekers connect with employers. That's kind of our whole premise. Um, so every person looks at it from their component. Some people may advise you on the back end setup, how to go in and check your profiles. Trevor Houston's really good about that. Um, Anna Morgan will teach you a little bit about that. In fact, we've got a SheRose conference coming up where Anna will be speaking on LinkedIn profiles. But for this guide, I've studied many, many, many experts and, and I will reference numerous people in the book, but um, I've read a lot of articles and basically it's kind of a compilation of all of those uh, things that we see. Most of the strategies we use are centered around sales techniques that relate to job seekers, right? So we all know there are similarities in a sales pitch and a, like identifying a solution or a problem that you solve for a company and going in and approaching the company as the solution that sells. So in truth, your job search has a lot to do with sales. Like I said, landing a new job is based on the premise that you are selling your ability to solve problems. And um, it's probably what I am most quoted for saying that people our companies hire solutions. They don't hire problems. They don't hire you because you need a job. They hire you because you solve their problems. All right. You have to figure out how you are the Tylenol for their headache. They have a pain point and you have to be the solution. That is a Clayton Stockdall quote. And we're a huge fan of Clayton's. And um, when he came on the job father, he, he said that, and that has just kind of stuck with me as a great way to describe how you have to be the Tylenol for their headache. All right. You have probably heard the phrase social selling index. You can check your social selling index. Um, and I, let me drop this in the chat really quick. Um, and you guys can see yours. Um, ha, I'm, I do talk fast, I'm sorry. Paula's calling me out here. All right, I bet I have a lot of information to cover. So I'd rather talk fast and send you the replay than not be able to cover content because of time constraints. All right, so in the chat, I just dropped a link. Um, it's, nope, ignore that one. I can't type and talk apparently. LinkedIn.com sales SSI. All right, use the second link I just dropped in the chat and um, that will help you to check your own SSI. But what a social selling index is. Sales techniques are all about finding solutions to problems, which is why sales strategies work well for finding opportunities or creating them and for landing jobs. LinkedIn has this powerful tool called the social selling index. Uh, LinkedIn SSI is a score of zero to 100 based on four pillars of social selling. Each pillar earns a maximum of 25 points to, overall, to the overall score. Ideally, you want to score of around 70 or above. The four pillars are establishing your professional brand, finding the right people, engaging with insight, and building relationships. Okay, We are not focusing on finding the right people or building relationships today. What I will tell you really quickly about that is connect with three to five people per day, um, preferably um, finding the right people comes from uh, connecting with influencers and decision makers. So what you're looking for is recruiters, hiring managers, people who hold a management director or executive title. And you want to, once you connect with them, send them a message, start a conversation. And this is where I teach a lot about earning the ask. So earning the ask means that I have earned the right to ask Lori to introduce me to Janet, okay? Um, if I don't know Lori, I can't ask her that. And I always go back to um, what I describe in my book called 
um, the bank account principal. And on the bank account principal, uh, it means that Lori and I start our relationship. I'm picking on you today, Lori. I should have warned you. Um, but Lori and I started our relationship with zero equity. So our balance is zero. I have to deposit into that account by doing something selfless, by taking an interest in Lori and not asking anything before I've earned the right to make a withdrawal from that account. So I earn trust by doing things that are not about me, like engaging in the content that Lori posts or asking her questions about herself or her company, but not in a, will you introduce me to Jerry or will you introduce me to Craig? That's not, will you review my resume? Though you haven't earned the right to ask for something in return, but getting to know somebody, asking about their expertise and taking an interest in them, that's how you build the equity in that account to say, hey, you know, would you mind scheduling a 10 minute call and telling me a little bit more about your company? I actually saw an opportunity posted there um, on your website. And I just thought I would ask you a few details about the organizational culture. Do you have 10 minutes? And people are more likely to say yes to 10 minutes than 15 because it's not as big of a percentage of their day. All right. Um, I've, so even, I've even got some attention and asked them for 13. And one guy responded back, he said, that got my attention, and so I realized you, you were going to be real, you know, to the point. Yes, sir, I am, and so. I love it. I think that's so, so smart. Odd, odd times, 11, 13, just. Absolutely, I, and I, I completely agree with you. I, um, when I was a, a sales trainer, uh, we were taught to use weird times because people remember them. So, hey, do you, do you have an available availability at 11 13 today um you know people are like that's so random but they'll remember it as opposed to um on the half hour an hour people miss appointments more so all right here is my own experience my goal is always to drive traffic to you i want you to be at the top of the most elite tier in recruiter searches which i'll explain more in a minute in my own business, when I took my social selling index from 60 to 76, I started receiving daily requests for resume writing and job search coaching services. So I've seen this at work. Being ranked in the top 1% of all talent, um, talent acquisition professionals and the top 1% of my 10K plus network was not one of my original goals, guys. But it isn't the numbers that I was getting that I was going for, but how to stand out against the competition and branding myself as an expert um, I had studied so hard to become. So I didn't spend all this time researching it to only know this information and not help anybody with it. So while I wasn't, my goal wasn't to become in the top 1%, I am a little bit competitive, especially with myself. And so I'm always gonna, I'm like, oh, 2%, we could get that up. Um, so I always look for areas of improvement, but my original goal was just to establish myself as an expert. I didn't even know these tools exist. Actually, Patty Bashy's who introduced me. The, this was taken today. Um, so this is my current social selling index. I'm sitting right at 80. Once you get over 70, I'll tell you it's a lot harder to get it to bump up. Um, but I'm sitting at the top 1% in industry and network. Um, where I, I struggle the most, honestly, is engaging with insight uh, because of time management and really just creating the time to go out there and post every single day. So now I post like two or three times a day. You just have to space it out and be really smart about how you do it. But um, I usually post once or twice a day and then going out and commenting on other people's posts. The second post, uh, component. So I did make sure that my little picture was up there so that you guys knew it really was me. And I left the time and date on the bottom of it so that y'all could see it was today. So I, I promise I won't lie to y'all. Uh, <laughs> but... Uh, if you notice, people in the industry of staffing and recruiting, shockingly, are not super engaged in LinkedIn. The average recruiter only has a recruit, uh, an SSI of 30%. What that tells you is they're using LinkedIn Recruiter, which is a separate portal than actually LinkedIn. So don't be alarmed if you notice that recruiters are not responding to your messages because they may not even be checking that inbox. It is a separate inbox, okay? So... Just be strategic and don't give up hope and think that it's just not working because this should tell you they're not actively engaged. That's also why you don't see a lot of recruiters posting jobs. Hopefully that will continue to change. I think it's a way underutilized tool. 
Um, and I think that needs to be the next service we offer is going in and teaching companies how to, or recruiters, how to use LinkedIn. But um, I think from a time management and they're so flooded and I think third-party companies um, offshore who flood recruiters with messages every single day. I used to get 30 to 40 messages a day asking, can we work on your jobs? Can we work on your jobs? And recruiters get disengaged very quickly just from a self-preservation point of view. Um, if you're in my network, the average uh, SSI is 40%. So um, I either have to kick out some of y'all who um, are scoring higher or make friends with people who aren't using LinkedIn. So my, kid, my ranking can be high. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but I got a question for you, Andy. Yeah. Um, thank you for showing us. I heard about this for months and I never knew where to go get it. So you're, oh, you're good. such a blessing. I just pulled mine up. Um, it was a 68. So my question nice. to you is this, um, when you when I'm looking at yours here, you've got those four numbers, 20.09, 19, yeah. 25. Do you sort of recommend that somebody in our position would focus on the lowest number, which is 15, go focus on that first or focus on the other? Yeah. So usually I say, um, you know, focus on your lowest first, absolutely. And maybe you spend all week just working on developing a routine for engagement. And then next you would focus on finding the right people because it's not just enough. It's how you find people. It's doing searches um, like the Boolean searches that I teach. Um, there's actually a YouTube video out there on how to do Boolean searches. Um, and I'll go over it briefly here, but you can go out there and see how to use that to find recruiters and find jobs on Google. So if you really focus one pillar at a time, it'll help. And um, we're going to focus on the two, what I think are the two most important for you guys, um, engaging with insight. And I'll explain that in a second and building uh, your professional brand. So I would say, right, those are your two top ones uh, because they determine your ranking. Um, and then finding the right people is obviously important and building relationships. That should be part of everything you do everywhere you go. Okay. And I find building relationships is usually the most common, but where people fall short on that one often is they connect with people and never speak to them. All right. What is your brand? What do you want people to think of when they see you, when they hear your name, when they view your profile? Establishing your professional brand is the most relevant pillar for job seekers. Okay. So this is what recruiters see when they when they engage with you, when they go to your profile, this is the most important because it's the face. It's how you show up to the interview, right? So you're replacing a firm handshake and eye contact with a profile and how you build that brand is so, so important. Not only does it involve having a complete profile with keyword rich content, but it also drives how your profile looks and serves as the first introduction to you, okay? So it's your business suit. It's what you wear. When a recruiter types in a Boolean search to find a candidate with a specific skill set, the results show up in three main categories. So recruiters build a search strand based on those keywords, operators and or not and near. And parentheses determine the results the recruiter sees. So if you're a math major like me, this makes total sense to you. If you hate math, you may hate this, but if you'll learn it, it really will help you. If I were looking for an HR business partner with experience in benefits, employee relations, and merger and acquisition, I might start with a search strand that looks like HR and business partner. So I would want them to have both of those terms in parentheses and benefits. And now I have two ways that that could appear, employee relations or ER. And quotes means it has to appear exactly like that so that I don't have like every time a word ends in ER, right? And merger and acquisition or M&A, okay? It has to be exact. If I put it in quotes, like if I put M&A in quotes, if they have M space and sign space A, it won't show up. It is that specific. So we have to, as recruiters, be creative, but you also have to think about how are people searching for you? And this is where you have to be the expert on your job. How are people going to find you? You have to think as a recruiter, don't think, so many times we teach creativity, but if we are only creative, sometimes we miss the mark on how other people think because not all 
people are going to be inside of our mindset. So if you use MFG instead of manufacturing, they may not find you because they may not even be thinking about how you could abbreviate it. So be very, very cautious. I know sometimes we abbreviate things or use acronyms to save space, but if they're not searching how we're searching, they're going to miss you. And if your search appearances on your LinkedIn profile, which I'll show you here in a second, um, if they aren't in triple digits, you need to go back and re keyword your profile. All right. Three results. The results will show up in LinkedIn Recruiter in three main tabs. The first tab will list all of the people. So in that role or in that example from the last slide, all of my HR managers showed up in column one. In column two are all of my HR managers who have the M&A and employee relationship, uh, relations and benefits. All of those who are open to work is column two. Column three is most likely to respond. So these are my people who are open to work, who if somebody sends you a message on LinkedIn, reply to it, even if the answer is no, thank you, because it will up your score and you will become in that most likely to respond. If I'm going to use one of my 60 in-mail credits to reach out, I'm going to do that on somebody who is most likely to respond to me. All right. Can I just point out, Craig, that it looks like you're the fourth head on Mount Rushmore? It does. It totally does. <laughs> I just had to point that out. Like it caught my eye out of the corner. I was like, okay, ADD moment, but it's hilarious. So I just wanted to point that out to other people so they could see it too. All right. <laughs> LinkedIn scans your entire profile to match the words in the search strand and rank the results based on keyword matching, matching de degree of connection and your engagement score. So that's the actual component not listed there. Okay, keyword matching, it pulls from any of your searchable fields like your tagline, your job titles, the about section, your, and under each job, you can put your bullet points from your resume. All of those are places to increase keywords, just like SEO on a website. So think about how when you search for something on Google, it ranks uh, your top one or your ads, which unfortunately job seekers can't do ads to get higher, but um Think about how those search results appear based on relevancy, and then it's the same concept. And how recruiters find you on job boards is the same way they find you on LinkedIn. There is something, and Andy. Yeah, go back to the previous slide. The second tab, um, you said open to work. So all results open to work and most likely to respond. That open yeah. to work is that the. Um, the hashtag with the, the green little ribbon around? Well, or... okay, so it's open to work. And it, so when you go to set your open to work status, you can say either only show it to recruiters, which it's rec mm -hmm. not all recruiters, but recruiters who have LinkedIn recruiter. Right, so right. I think that's a very important distinction that if somebody's not paying for that upgraded service, they wouldn't know you were open to work. Um, I don't like that there's not an option to show everybody and not have that green banner, but it is what it is. So you have to pick one way or the other, but it's anyone who has put on their open to work available to either the public or recruiters. So it's okay. in that status, not in the hashtag and the banner okay. comes from setting that status. Okay, so, fantastic. All right, let me stop here for a second and answer chat. Perfect. Okay, so O and O for all recruiters or um, the public, uh, there's not enough data or science behind that banner to speak for or against it. Um, experts will tell you on either side, but most experts are only speaking from their personal opinion, and I'm not one to do that. So this is what I call picking out curtains. Curtains don't change the functionality of the room, they change how pretty it looks. So I'm not a huge fan of the green that they chose. I'm not a huge fan of a lot of things about it. However, go back to whether or not you want only recruiters to see it. So if you're actively working, only recruiters, and they do take measures to make sure your company doesn't see it, they say. I'm going to say, don't put that on me, they say. Um, but here's a good example. If they suspected that you were open to work and wanted to see that, I could have Lori go in and check it from a different company that I know her. So there's no foolproof way to say they won't find out. 
But if you are actively working, I definitely wouldn't put that green banner. I think it's a slap in the face to your employer. Oh, Lori, you hit a sore spot with our... Uh-oh. <laughs> How do you suggest handling connection requests to try to solicit services or product? Oh, um, you can block as quick as you can accept a request. So I usually... Now, I would love to tell you that I'm always in tune with my relationship to Jesus, that I'm always nice to people who reach out to me inappropriately, but I'm not. And so um, there are times that I have to repent after I respond. And usually it has to do, I'm, I really, I'm not like cussing at people or anything like that, but I do mess with them a little bit. Um, so when they're like, hey, we can solve all the problems for your um, staffing company, then I usually reply, please go to my profile and show me where I have a staffing company. Like, um, and it just, there, and here's what, and I actually have learned more about this as a manager or a CEO, I'm, I'm supposed to say that, um, but um because we've had people solicit service to us to come in and manage that piece where they're actually spam people for us. And I'm going, you're asking me to pay for something that I speak against. So I'm very cautious, but a lot of times it's actually not even a human that's doing it. They're paying a service um, to go out and actually make connection requests and send those messages to you. So feel free to um, just reply stop or I'm not interested because it will trigger that um, spam machine to, um, it'll trigger the computer to stop sending you messages and take you out of their sequence. I will note, she was one of the ones we sent a note to yesterday. Well, Paula did that. So I'm just going to say, um, <laughs> no, we, but we're not paying a service and we're not spamming people. So we've reached out to people who are like, oh, and no, just saying, Hey, is there any way that we can help you? That's our goal. Um, but we're not trying to just spam people and um, we don't do these follow-up messages. Um, and how you can tell you're in a sequence for spam is if the messages keep coming on a regular basis. So like the next day or same day, they'll say something along the lines of, I just wanted to bump this to the top or I don't mean to, um, to I don't, I want to respect your inbox. That's like my least favorite Um but there's, there's certain, like, you can just kind of tell after a while, but just know it's probably not a human actually sitting there spamming you. They're not stalking you. You're in a computer sequence and it's like, connect with this person. And once they do wait this much time, send this message. If they don't reply in this much time, send this message. And it's all like a, a sequence. So. Diane asked us the banner auto pop. So there is a, there is a banner and guys, LinkedIn, I am not on their advisory committee. So let's just go ahead and get that out of the way. So when they changed the entire interface of LinkedIn, they did not consult me. I'm not a fan of the banners. I recommend going into Canva and we're gonna get into that here in a second, but um, I recommend going into Canva and creating a banner. It doesn't have to be fancy or you can uh, work with us and we will create a banner for you. And I promise it'll be pretty. And that's one of my favorite things I do because sometimes I just need creative space. All right, I'm gonna go on if you wanna watch the comments. Yep. All right, perfect. Let's look at our um, all-star status comes, it's not as fancy as it sounds, guys. It really just means you have all of the fields filled out. Um, so a professional photo, and we're gonna talk about all of these components, a completed headline or tagline, completed about section, current position and previous work. So this is what I'm gonna tell you about that. Again, I think it was a little bit short-sighted in the algorithm to have a platform that literally was designed for job seekers, but only promote them if they have a current job. So I think it was ridiculous, but um, we're going to talk about how to get around that here in a second. Current position and previous work history, skills and expertise and education. If all of those are filled out, you should notice this nice, neat little, like, all-star ribbon that pops up and says, congratulations, you're an all-star. And then it'll put it, you're the only one that knows whether or not you're an all-star. So um, it's not like this huge prestigious thing other than it does, it does affect how you um, rank. So this is from a couple of months ago. I haven't um, looked at my stuff and I'll, I'll show you, I'll pull up my LinkedIn profile here at the end if we have time. And I'll just kind of show you my profile and my numbers um, and kind of how it is in action. Your profile picture does not have to be a professional headshot. However, your professional does need to be a headshot of you being professional. So that is an Andy quote right there. Feel free to use it. Um, so this is where I will talk to you. If you would not take 
your family to a job interview, which you shouldn't, um, or your pets, they don't need to be in your profile picture. Ladies, be aware of your necklines. Um, I'll leave that there. And um, make sure you are dressed in business professional attire that you would wear to a job interview. Okay. So um, again, you don't have to go get professional headshots. I recently got professional headshots for the first time ever in my life. And Paula will tell you it was the most awkward experience ever um, because it was so far out of my comfort zone. But if you can, um, we have a great person. My headshots, we, I am on a shoestring startup budget. So we found somebody who um, was a referral, a friend of a friend who is a police officer in Arlington who does this on the side to subsidize income because we don't play, pay our law enforcement enough. And um, he is, he only charges a, a hundred dollars for professional headshots and he'll come to you. Oh, so he takes, what, he take 50? Yeah, he probably took 50 or 60 pictures just snapping them back to back. And we were like on the street and downtown yeah, Burleson, locations. which old town Burleson, there is a downtown Burleson, contrary to what people think. Um, mm -hmm. But I will tell you, it, he is worth it. So if you're looking for a referral, reach out to Paula. She loves when I send people to her um, and she will get you connected with the gentleman and his wife that came and did ours. It was, it really was worth it. But um, if you don't have a hundred dollars to drop on it, don't take a selfie. I don't care. My profile for years was a selfie picture that I took in front of a blank wall right? Just don't have this weird kissy face or, you know, like weird angle. I prefer pictures from above me because it controls how many of my chins you see. Like all of this, I appreciate, but not necessarily business appropriate. So at some point you have to accept who you are and put it out there in the world. Okay. Um, please, please, please. And I'll do this before I move on. Don't use an outdated picture guys. Nobody wants to be catfished. When you have a picture from 1943 and you log in and you don't look like you did in 1943, then, and really, like I'm being really, really exaggerating, but um, no. we do see a lot of people that have their pictures from early 2000s or 10, 20 years ago um, because they are afraid of age discrimination. I will tell you, dishonesty will lose opportunities faster than age discrimination any day. And it feels dishonest when I look at a profile picture and somebody logs on and I'm like, I don't think you're the same person. So um, I just will say, be current, be authentic and be relevant. And you want the same consistency. The language you use in your profile needs to match how you talk. If a professional writes your profile for you, not with you, and they don't say words like you speak, then it's going to feel inauthentic and it creates the seed of a doubt of whether or not you are who you say you are. Okay, I'll leave that alone now. And I'll try to make sure that's the only thing I mean to y'all about today. All right, headlines and taglines. What, what words are recruiters looking for? Only go out of the box after you have addressed what is in the box. Okay, so a lot of times we see these things like, like I love to put things like crown straightener or whatever on my profile, but I also know if I was in the market for a job, nobody out there is looking to hire a crown straightener, right? Um, although they should, but um, we have to think about what are people searching for? So if you're going to put something in there, like that you're like a super guru of whatever, or the Olympic champion of filing, make sure that you have something <laughs> relevant to what you do right now. Okay. Job titles separated by the pipe symbol. Me and Paula have argued about this. Google has solved it. It is called a pipe symbol. Um, it is located right above the enter key on your keyboard. Um, and so job titles separated by the pipe symbol. Um, you can have multiple jobs, um, jobs as long as they go together. So I don't want to see like dog walker, line cook, and CEO. Those don't go together, <laughs> right? So just make sure we're using phrases and words that align and how recruiters would find you. And then taglines such as I help companies with, or for me, I help job seekers navigate the digital hiring process. Okay. So what is your I help statement? And that becomes part of your brand. You need to probably go back on that last slide and hit the stuff we hit on last night on job volume. About um, pictures, you, you never want to put post on LinkedIn about stuff that you don't. Oh, that's content. We'll get, we'll get into that. Okay. Yes, we will. Right. Um, but we will talk about that. Um, so to mirror or not to mirror, 
That's the question. It's very debated among experts across the um, job seeker and influencer community. And this is where I will go back and I will challenge um, to make sure that we're doing what is data driven and scientifically based, not just what gets us likes and followers, because you can have 400 likes and still be unemployed. And it turns out when you file your unemployment claim, one of the questions that they ask is not how many likes did you have on your post this week? So I just want to point that out. Um, recruiters find you the same way on LinkedIn that they do on job boards. So offer the same information, right? At least the same keywords, Lori, that little cry face made me happy. Um, but they find you the same way. So we want to give at least the same information, even if we phrase it a little bit differently, you have creative liberties on LinkedIn. You don't have on your, um, resume, whoever in the history of forever, decided we don't use personal pronouns on resumes. And I understand how ridiculous it is. And it goes against all grammatical rules that we've ever followed. We just don't. Um, so on your profile, you can actually add I statements or my team or I believe whatever. Um, so it should be a personalized version of your resume summary and core competencies. Make sure you have those keywords. It is a great way to pack those words in there in a meaningful way. I am not a fan of just random strands of keywords, right? Um, use them in engaging ways that say, I don't, not only do I know this word, but I know how to use it in a sentence, right? Um, so like true demonstration of your capabilities and knowledge. It should also include your email address. Here's the reason. If somebody is not connected with you, they don't know how to contact you and they would have to spend an email credit to find you unless you have this in your about section and they can see right then and there how to shoot you a message. You can also put your email address in your banner, which we'll talk about in a second. You can write your about section in the first person narrative, whereas on resumes, it is not acceptable to write in the first person. The text needs to be rich with keywords. Um, about what you do, how you do it. And it is a searchable field on, um, on LinkedIn. So recruiters are searching for you. That does appear. All right. Um, work history should mirror the company's job titles and dates listed on your resume. I cannot tell you how many times we have seen people lose opportunities because they decided to mess around with the dates on their resume and it didn't align. So when somebody went to their LinkedIn, it says, oh, like I see four jobs in between the two you listed, um, something fishy here. Again, it, nobody wants to be catfish. Um, so I will teach you what I teach my clients that the most powerful emotion is disappointment. When what you expected to happen or what you, who you thought somebody was turns out to not be the reality. It will drive you to do and do things and react in a way that you would not normally. So it is a powerful emotion. Make sure that everything aligns. So if they go to through your resume, they're like, this is amazing. And they click on your profile and they're like, this is not amazing. This doesn't match. Then it creates doubt. Okay. If you uh, be sure to include the bullet points from your resume for each of the positions to add those keywords to your profile in a way that gets them on your profile and doesn't seem super spammy. All right. If you aren't currently working, there's a trick of the trade I learned from the world-renowned resume writer uh, or resume expert, Kirsty Bonner. So Kirsty was a dynamic influencer in the community. She is actually uh, touted with getting the dates removed from education requirements on LinkedIn. Um, but she was a huge, huge part of the community um, who passed away earlier this year. So I, I do like to always give credit here, but list your current employment job title as current uh, seeking so I would say, you know, seeking an instructional design position. And then in the company name, you can use hashtag ONO, that's searchable, or you could even use maximize your job search. You're welcome. Um, so you can use our name, whatever you're most comfortable with. I usually have people do ONO. Um, and when it comes up as philanthropic or something, um, but you can use that. It is a searchable phrase. ONO is a commonly recognized phrase used to indicate that a LinkedIn user is open to new opportunities. So on your tagline, I even usually go back and put hashtag ONO. All right, skills and expertise. When selecting skills to list on your LinkedIn profile, be strategic. Think in about skills that are a recruiter would search for to find you. You could be the Olympic champion of filing, but if you're applying for a director level role and filing won't be a part of your job responsibilities in your target role, it shouldn't be listed in your skill section. So a lot of times we see, um, 
I'll, I'll use sales as an example because Craig may have in his profile that he works with software developers or that he may put software development lifecycle in their SDLC, he will get contacted for software development roles every single time. But that's not what he does. But not everybody stops and reads. And my favorite profile that I've seen when I was a recruiter, somebody put in their, um, in their about section, um, I get 20 to 30 recruiter requests a day. Um, if you're actually reading this message, put giraffe in the subject line of your message. And so he would only respond if you put giraffe. I thought it was the most brilliant thing ever. Um, so I'm just saying, if y'all want to just have a little bit of fun. Um, it shouldn't. So as a side note, help your connections by endorsing them for skills and giving genuine recommendations. All right. So you want to help your community out, go out and be an endorser and a recommender. Um, list your education for all degrees you have finished. If you didn't complete your degree, then under the degree title list coursework toward or towards whichever part of the country you're from there. Um, and then the degree name and then list the school that you attended, okay? So you can have coursework toward, and I have this on my profile because I actually didn't finish my degree. So um, you can see that in action there. All right, LinkedIn banners. This is the fun part. A LinkedIn banner is one of the easiest ways to create a professional brand that appeals to target companies. I should be able to look at your brand and know what you do. So while I do kind of think Craig should post his head in the, you know, Mount Rushmore crew as part of it on his LinkedIn banner. Also, I wouldn't tell me what he does for a living. So while I'm loving it, I think that probably not for your banner. Um, so I want to be able to look at your banner and it support what you do for a living. And there are so many ways to do that. But I recommend using a royalty-free picture that represents your industry and includes your name, job title, and contact information. What I do tell people is don't put your phone number if you're not comfortable with people calling you. At least put your email address though. Like I'm one of those people that thinks like cyber, cyber stalking shouldn't be a thing. Like just delete them. We're good. So um, if, if people are spamming you or stalking you, um, then you're good. Just delete them. Um, so don't hesitate to give your email address. You can even create an email address just for your job search, but don't put your phone number unless you're super comfortable with it. And you can get a Google number out there um, to use for your job search. Use clean images that are free from too much text or a lot of graphics. We see this a lot where people have crazy busy um, banners and people won't kind of sort through that. So just kind of be clean and concise with it and make sure it represents you. Quotes are good as long as they are linked back to your brand. Um, if they're one of your quotes, great. And then a picture of scenery is not the best option unless you're a photographer. Um, so banners need to be 1584 by 396 in order to fit on LinkedIn. If you're on the free version of Canva, just know the LinkedIn banner is not sized correctly and you can't resize it on the free version. So when you design your banner, use the middle space only and understand that the sides are going to be cut off. Okay. Um, but I do, I recommend Canva wholeheartedly. It's super easy to use. I create all kinds of digital background or, you know, backgrounds that have kind of a digital feel to them. Um, so you, you'll see all kinds of banners. It's something I change frequently. Um, you actually want to update your profile um, once a week or so um, so that you continue to stay at the top of searches. I usually tell people go in on Sunday evenings um, at some point and just refresh your LinkedIn profile. You can change any one thing. It could be your about section, adding a period, taking it away, changing a word, something to show I'm actively engaged in updating my information. Um, also, you want to make sure that you don't have all these random numbers and letters on your profile. Sorry. Here we go. Um, so in your URL, your address at the top, if it has all these random numbers and letters, when you're looking at your profile right next to your banner, it says edit public profile and URL. It'll open a new tab and then you can edit your public profile and URL there. Um, you'll want something like um, Janet Dash Young, or if she's not the only Janet Dash Young, then maybe throw in your middle initial there too. Okay. Get creative, but I think people put too much stock in this. It does not help people find you. So let's be very clear about that. Never in the history of forever have I said, 
I'm going to connect with Craig Bohall. Let me try to guess what his LinkedIn URL is. That's not how it works. We go to LinkedIn, we search for Craig Bohall and hope to see his picture. Um, and that's just kind of how we search for people. If we know their companies, we use it. But nobody is trying to guess your URL, but it does look much better on a resume um, than having random numbers and letters that don't mean anything. All right. Recommendations are like re uh, LinkedIn gold. They equate to endorsements and uh, certify that you are who you say you are and that you do what you say you can do. Giving and receiving recommendations are equally important. I pay a lot of attention to recommendations that uh, candidates give others because it tells me how they talk to and about other people. How do they build up their teams? Don't hesitate to request recommendations or offer to exchange recommendations with past colleagues. You can get recommendations from managers, coworkers, clients, vendors, or people you network with or stand in line next to at the grocery store. I don't care. Um, just go out and get some recommendations and um, have people tell how wonderful you are. Okay. All right. Featured content section. This is one of my favorite. Um, pick your most amazing and relevant post that you have. The one that gets the most engagement or the post that you are most proud of. Um, and those should be marked as uh, featured content. You can turn on that and add the profile section if you don't currently have it. Make sure that you have that profile section turned on in your settings so that you can support your professional brand with engaging content. The content you should create should be an extension of your knowledge and your expertise, okay? Engaging with insight. You want three to five posts per week, at least 12 words per post. So for each post, you want at least 12 words. So I can go out and share an industry article about recruiting or hiring or staffing, whatever. But when I, I, I can copy and paste 12 words or, you know, a quote from it that's at least 12 words long. I can write my own words. I can say why um, it means it meant something to me. I can say, hey, Janice Downey, and I can tag her. Um, so the at symbol you use to tag people, a hashtag is for topics. And so those are very clear distinctions. So I don't want to hashtag Janice Downey. I want to tag her with the at symbol. And I can say, hey, Janice Downey shared this article. And I want, you know, I thought, I thought it was super interesting, wanted to share it with my network. And I, that can be my original post for the day. Um, three comments per day on other people's posts, and those comments need to be at least eight words to trigger the engagement score. So I know as moms, we have the ability to have two word communications like stop that, be quiet, come here and love it. So those are just the way we communicate as moms. However, um, the LinkedIn engineers disagree that that's effective communication strategies. And so they want us to use at least eight words and have actual meaningful comment or commentary with other people. Okay. Avoid the spam filter. Um, hang on just a sec. Okay. Um, all right. Use good grammar in your post. That includes capitalization, punctuation, word usage, and spelling. Uh, there are apps like Grammarly that can assist you. You can even type your post into Microsoft Word or Google Docs to run a grammar check on the post before you copy it back over into LinkedIn and click on the post button. Don't use external links. Um, you can post like um, when I posted about this um, particular uh, webinar, I said, hey, we're about to start it. We have a few spots open. The the um, Link to join is in the comments below, okay? So um, if you're going to post an external link, do it in the comments instead of the post itself. The algorithm will be nicer to you. They want to keep people engaged on the LinkedIn platform. So make sure that you are posting, um, like if you, if you update a status, you'll notice that it gets a ton of engagement because the LinkedIn algorithms um, are very nice to you because it keeps people engaged on their post. If you share an article that's in the LinkedIn article section, again, great way to get people um, get people engaged because the LinkedIn algorithm gods will shine in favorably upon you. So don't post multiple links that's frowned upon and don't tag more than five people. This is a big, big no-no. Um, strategic tagging is critical but you can usually get away with tagging six people if all six engage with the post. But as a general rule of thumb, don't spam people by tagging a ton of people on the post and flooding their notifications every time 
someone likes or comments. So a really quick way to get removed from um, my um, my friendly list is um, to tag me on every post that you make or to tag me in a comment that has like 400 other people with it um, or even 20 other people. And I get notified every time anything happens with it and it's exhausting. And think about if all of my clients and past clients did that, what that would be like. Um, I already don't sleep, so I don't want to go there. Um, so don't tag more than five people. It will trigger a spam filter. When somebody, so if I tag Paula, when she engages with that post, it validates to the spam filter that this is the real deal. It's not that I'm just randomly tagging people for engagement sake. Don't post more than every three hours. Um, it's another critical piece. Many experts say not to post more than 20 times a month. I have, I have not seen that play out, so I don't teach that. But I will say that the algorithms don't work well if you post too often. Um, and so I kind of made them mad right now, I think. And um, I've noticed my um, views are going down a little bit um, in the last couple of posts. But I've been posting a lot of like job seeker videos and things like that. Um, it is important to remember that algorithms reward text only post. Um, and like every other platform where you're taught to add a picture or a video, LinkedIn actually um, promotes text only post higher than it does the others. Um, post frequency, LinkedIn wants to see a lot of content from a lot of people rather than flooding feeds with heavy hitters while ignoring everyday people. The first post goes through the algorithms normally. Posting a second time on the same day will work only if it has a huge amount of engagement. It takes three times the amount of engagement on a second post for it to rank as high on the first post of the day. The caveat to this is if the first two posts are at least three hours apart, they are treated the same by the algorithm. A third post is completely ignored by the algorithm. So that's like, hey, that was too much. I'm sorry, you're voted off the island. Okay. Isn't that just way too much? Yeah. Information for everybody. Yes. Yes. Are we? All right. So according to Hootsuite, this is kind of what I prescribed to you. And um, the best times of day includes 745, 1045, 1245, and 445. Here's where it's debatable. They say it's Eastern. Other experts say eh, it's actually kind of adopted to your current time zone. I tend to use this as my general rule of thumb. And if you think about it, it makes total sense the beginning of day before people start work or at the you know very beginning of their work day lunch hour and at the end of the day if you kind of follow those that's when traffic is highest those are the ebbs and flows so it's widely accepted that the noon hour is the highest traffic time on linkedin and that posts between 11 and 1 will experience the greatest chance for engagement during the golden hour period so let me kind of go over what that golden hour looks like the golden hour starts the second you you click post and LinkedIn runs for 60 minutes. It goes out to the people who are most likely to engage with you. So those are usually the people that you've engaged with recently and have engaged with you recently. So you're going to show up on their feeds as this test audience. During that uh, golden hour, how you rank, how the engagement works during that golden hour will determine what happens next. So if nobody engages, it just kind of falls out of the algorithm. But if people engage, it then goes to a human LinkedIn editor who reviews this content and says it's spam, low quality or high quality. They have the ability to bump it up, make it a trending topic. Um, if you use a hashtag, you might see um, this, this topic or this post is trending on Monday motivation or whatever that is. Um, the most important rule is don't post and ghost. Don't post something and quickly leave and then not engage with those who are engaging with the post. If somebody posts a comment, you want to go and thank them and then have an engaging conversation. That makes post engaging. Um, add a comment to your post that provides a link to your website, portfolio, or article uh, for another LinkedIn profile. Then when viewers engage with your post, engage back with them. Meaningful engagement, which equals to at least eight words per comment. So this is again, working with those algorithms. Okay. Very good. Do's and don'ts. Do post at critical times. Do ask questions that spark engagement at the end of the post. Do follow a consistent but not rigid posting schedule so followers know when to check your page out for content. Do respond to anyone who engages. 
make it a habit to go back and check your post. Do strategically tag people who you feel like will engage with your post in the comments. Do tag one industry professional or influencer in the post or comments. Don't tag people on your post unless you know they will respond quickly. Uh, use comments to tag people you aren't sure will engage with the post and when tagging them briefly explain why you're tagging them. So if you say, hey, um, Andy, I saw this article. It made me think of something you recently said, thought, of, um, have you seen it or whatever? I'm more likely to engage with that than if you just tag me with five or 10 other people. Don't go back and edit your post. It will actually re uh, weaken your reach and the algorithm doesn't really know what to do with it. All right, uh, we're almost done, I promise, guys. <laughs> what I have learned personally, um, posts that promote LinkedIn engagement or loop back to a LinkedIn service will always rank higher and receive an, algor uh, an algorithm boost. Labels work. If I use the title job seeker tip of the day before my daily uh, text only job seeker post, it gets two times more engagement than if I don't label it. Algorithm boost do not factor in previously uh, successful post. Every post has to hold its own merit. If I share a post, it will get much higher views if I state why I'm sharing it and tag the original content creator. Reshares are completely ignored by the algorithm. It is better to go to the original post, share it, and tag both the content creator and the person on whose feed you saw it. External links, links that require you to leave LinkedIn to view them, rank lower and should be saved for the comment section. Embedded links are picked up in the algorithm and are ranked higher than external links, but not as high as content that originates and stays on LinkedIn. So if I have like a YouTube video that you can click right there and stay on the page and see it, it'll rank higher than if I send you to my website to, the, to view the uh, video. Post engagement during the golden hour determines a lot about the algorithm. All right. Um, we are here to help you guys. And uh, I wanted to make sure I told you before um, you guys drop off of here um, that we do have two specials going. Um, we're doing LinkedIn and resumes for 200 and we are doing our 30 day program, which is my favorite thing that we've ever done um, for 350. So reach out to Paula on those if you have and any questions. Explain why your favorite program. Oh, is. Paula wants me to tell you about 30 day. So 30 day program, is where we literally take job seekers by the hand and take them through their entire job search. We do your resume. Um, and if you've ever been to one of my ATS webinars or seen me post, I'm very passionate about resume writing. But we do your resume, we do your LinkedIn, we create a banner for you. We have uh, weekly calls with the group. We have weekly one-on-ones. Um, we really help from every aspect from interview coaching to job search strategy. And um, so I'm excited about this program. It's definitely where we're seeing the biggest um, results. Um, we, we started our original group with 23 people. There are now only two, two or th there's only two people who haven't been in final stages of interviews yeah. during the program. And it started um, 45 or 60 days ago. So 45 days ago. Um, so it's been really, really great. Um, and we've taken everybody from executives to entry level people um, through it and we've seen huge results. So definitely um, let us know if there's anything we could do to help you. Um, I'm gonna close this and go to the comments really quick so I can answer questions and I'll open it up for Q and A. Oh, bombshell videos. Bomb bomb? Yeah, I said bombshell videos. Okay, so. I have mixed feelings on bomb bomb videos. I do think they're great for comments, Liberty. Um, I, I think that's a great way to use them. Um, just know that not everybody will be in a place that they can view them. Um, and so if somebody can't tell what a video is, they're usually very hesitant to click on it. And I'll tell you, like you have kind of rocked out the um, bomb bomb videos. Um, and so I, I saw yours and I thought it was great, but there was this hesitancy of going, okay, I don't know this. And I'm about to get a virus on my computer. So because LinkedIn changes the uh, LinkedIn URL, you can't really see what it's for. So what I would tell you on that is just introduce it. Um, I, hey, I created this video for you. Um, you know, and just kind of introduce it. But I do think it's a great way. What I don't like bomb bomb for is to make a first connection and a private message with somebody that you don't know. So that's not my favorite. Um, 
our energy dump at this time. Let's see. Did that answer your question, Liberty? All right. Okay. All right, perfect. So um, what questions can I answer for you guys about LinkedIn? I know I went through that and I will get you guys the video for this um, and we'll get you out the, um, the slide deck as well so you can see it. But is this helpful at all? Yes. Okay, good. Craig, is this all old news for you? Uh, not really old. Some of it was new, some of it was, I was uh, heard before, but um, I did have a question for you. Yeah. Uh, both uh, Fanny and uh, Trevor have talked in the past couple of months about not sharing somebody else's post, but going in and actually taking bits and pieces of it and sort of creating your own post out of, so I would say Andy said this the other day, and these are the two quotes out of it. It takes a lot more work doing it that way. So tell me your feelings about doing the more work or just sharing your post. So this is, I have a couple of thoughts on this as a job search strategist. I would tell you first, does the post extend your brand? So is it something that you want people to know about as part of who you are professionally or that you think will inspire your network or whatever? So explain why you're posting, okay? Um, and so then I don't have a problem with resharing. Just make sure you tag them. Now, if Fanny shared it from the leadership team at whatever company and you're resharing it from her, you will get virtually zero love in that algorithm. So there's legitimacy to that, okay? Um, I think that's what her comment was, is that just by sharing other people's posts, you don't really get any bump for yourself. Right, I agree. Now, a lot of it goes back to what is your intent with creating that? Are you looking for engagement? Are you looking to, to brand yourself? Right. So if it's an article, go to the original article and then share it from there. You'll do better than resharing it from somebody else's post. Okay, cool, thanks. Um, and then just make mention of, I saw this on Fanny's show or whatever, um, but I'm not a huge fan of just resharing other people's content as your only source. I do recommend coming up with some original content to share um, your thoughts, your expertise, and there are a ton of ways that you could uh, create content and, um, and it be meaningful and engaging and be an extension of your knowledge. Hey, Andy. Yes, hey. It's Alicia. Hi, I have a quick question for you. Um, I would like to know in regards to the Ono, uh, Ono, oh no, uh, not Ono, oh Ono. Oh yeah, you know what no. I'm talking about. Open for new opportunities, yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Um, I, I wanted to know, have you heard of anything uh, where recruiters are um, actually putting not like that, that uh, those statements that you had, like the N or, or et cetera, uh, possibly using the not uh, for opportunities, uh, looking for job seekers, but actually looking for employed people instead? So one, I think it's short-sighted. Does it happen? Yes. Um, where we see that the most um, is that people, how do I say this? Um, you see it more in agencies or independent recruiters, not at companies. So there are times a company doesn't want to pay a recruiter to find somebody that they can find themselves. So if I, if I can find you on a job board, I don't want to pay somebody $20,000 to find you. And so that's really where that even stemmed from is the people are looking for people like passive candidates. Um, but that came along the lines of kind of a, an agency process, not usually corporate recruiters. Um, I think especially during COVID, that would be really, really short-sighted. Um, not to say there aren't stupid people in the world, because I think we all know there are, but um, I'm sorry, that was not Christian of me, but, um, <laughs> but it was very honest. Um, but there are people that um, do short-sighted things like say, I'm only interested in hiring somebody who's actively working. And that comes from the misconception that um, good people are working, which we all know good people lose their job every day, especially during a pandemic. All right, thank you. It ultimately boils down to the same thing anybody who's ever been single in their 40s does when they go on a new date and they're sitting across from somebody going, why are you single? 
Like it's the whole thing of why are you on the market? Why, like, do you live in your parents' basement? Do you have a collection? <laughs> collections like like it's yeah um so I just I kind of look at it from that point of view but yeah good question anybody else all right if there's anything we can do to help in your job search please reach out to us um it's really easy to find us and um, you can do Paula at maximizeyourjobsearch.com or for those of you who have complained to us that our URL is too long um, you can do Paula at myjobsearch.org or Andy at maximizeyourjobsearch.com or Andy at myjobsearch.org are your main points of contact. Um, for those of you who know Tracy also works with us, you can reach out to her as well. Okay. Um, Thank you, Andy. Thank you. Anytime. Um, and guys, if you aren't signed up for next week, um, there's two things next week. Um, we have an interview. And I have a really different approach on interviews, as you can imagine. So reach out um, and log in for that one as and same link um, as this one. And then also I'm part of the career she is next week where I'm partnering with Anna Morgan and Barbie Winterbottom to deliver some amazing content next week. So you can find all of those webinars on our website. All right. Thank you. We will see you all later. Bye. All right. Bye.